Good morning, everybody. Hey, isn't it a beautiful day outside? Why are we shut up in here? We need to open the shades, right? Let's open up the shades. Let's see outside. It's going to be beautiful. They'll go up slowly, I'm sure, but it's going to happen. It's going to be great. Well, welcome. I'm so glad that you were here today. And as we kick off this series about family, I feel like I need to start it off with a little bit of a confession. They say confession is good for your soul. I'm a little worried about it, but you know, we're going to dive in anyway. You're probably going to think less of me by the end of this story. But I've got three kids, and I remember the infant phase of having those three kids very, very well. By remember, I mean it's a foggy blur of lack of sleep, but I remember it really well. My wife loved the infant phase. For those of you that have had kids before, think back to what that's like. Those first couple of months, my wife is like amazing at this stuff. She is a baby ninja. My wife could juggle two kids in one hand and she could change a diaper in the other hand and emotionally connect with them all at the same time. Like my kids are forever better because of my wife. Me on the other hand... I liked it a lot when they got to like seven or eight months and they're big fat butterballs with like rolls on their wrists and they're smiley. But the infant phase, you love them because they're yours. But you don't like them yet because <laughs> you don't know them yet, right? And I think the hardest part of the infant phase, at least for me, was the lack of sleep because I need my sleep. And we would, uh, we would divide the night up into two different shifts. 3 a.m. was the center point. So my wife took the pre-3 a.m. shift. I took the post-3 a.m. shift. The way this would work is uh, she would take the baby at about 9.30 or 10 o'clock. She'd feed the baby, change him, swaddle him up real, real tight, put him in bed, say some sort of magical spell over the child and he would sleep. Sleep all the way until three in the morning. And then at three in the morning, she would hear through the baby monitor a little bit of cooing and she'd go in there and they'd have a wonderful special moment. She'd feed him, she'd change him, give him to me and give me a baby monitor in the other hand and say, your shift. Here I go. And so I go into his bedroom and I would, I would sing to him. I'd read him stories. I'd speak sweetly to him. I'd rock him, try to put him down and tiptoe out the nursery door. And he'd cry like over and over. And that, that baby monitor was the worst invention on the planet because you just kept, it kept on going off over and over and over again. And this happens night after night, which does not good, do good things for my brain. I can't think very well. After several nights of this and a particularly hard night, I remember walking after the baby monitor goes off, walking into his nursery thinking, I think we have a communication problem here. <laughs> I think really what needs to happen is I need to just express how I feel about this situation. I need to tell him what I'm hoping he will do and why it's important to me. And I got to be honest with it. Tone matters though, right? Tone matters with kids. So I pick up this newborn, precious bundle of joy in my arms and look him in the eyes and I say, what is wrong with you, buddy? <laughs> Why won't you go to sleep? I think you get this from your mom's side of the family, don't you? <laughs> is it because you don't like me? That's okay. I don't like you either. <laughs> if you don't go to sleep, I'm going to follow you on your first date and tell stories about changing your diapers. Oh, did you lose your pacifier? I'll show you where you can find your pacifier. <laughs> and guess what? He went to sleep. <laughs> and I thought, I'm a genius. I've done it. I've cracked the code. I could do this. And I, I put him down on the bed. I tiptoe out of the bedroom, out of his nursery. I go into our bedroom thinking, this is just our little secret. Nobody knows about this. And I open the door. And sitting on the nightstand with two red judging eyes is the baby monitor. And I think, oh no. And I look over at my wife and she says, I heard every word. Stop swearing at the baby. You're going to scar him for life. So please pray for me. Pray for my kids probably is more who, who needs the prayer or that I didn't scar them for life. <laughs> but we're talking about family in this series. And there are all kinds of families that are represented in this room. I know that. We've got, we have traditional families, nuclear families. We have non-traditional families. We have blended families in the room. We have people for whom friends are family. And all of us together, we're a family in the sense that we are the family of God. God, we are a church family. But what's universal 
for all families, whoever it is that you surround yourself and you call that your family, what's universal about that family is families have enormous influence on our life. Your family can be a huge source of joy. Family can bring you community. Family can paint a picture of God and draw the best out of you. And I think probably most of us have experienced the other side of that too, that families can bring pain. Families can make us feel lonely and isolated. Families can be a picture of brokenness. They can pull the worst out of us. And I'm not just talking about our current family, the current people that we surround ourselves. Our first families have huge influence over our life today. Our families of origin, our past experiences still impact our life today. Now you might say, hang on, Matt. That's, I don't know that I buy that. The past is the past. What happened then is stays in the past. It doesn't necessarily influence my life today. And I'd like to, I'd like to wish that that was true. But for me, at least, it's not true. What happened then affects who I am now. I don't know about you, but for me, I've got like a, a replay in my mind of specific events, of specific conversations, of specific experiences that happened in my family of origin, those, those past experiences that replay again and again and again in my mind. And I learned a lot of important lessons when I was a kid. I'm sure you did too. Learned a lot of lessons as a kid. And a friend reminds me that what we learn first, we learn best. The things that we learn in our family of origin, the lessons that we learn from our experiences when we're young become the patterns and the templates that we use throughout the rest of our life. What happened then does affect who we are now. It affects the way, the way that we eat. I'm from Texas, so I love barbecue. I say y'all, I wear cowboy boots. I'm pretty sure Texas is its own country, right? It affects the way that we think. It affects the way that we think about ourselves, about who God is, about who others are. What happened then affects how we act now. Think about it this way. Think about it as if we all have a garden in our soul. Doesn't this look incredible? Can we thank the people who built this? Yeah, I'm super impressed. But think about it as if we all have a garden in our soul that has seeds, plants, and fruits. All of us with this garden in our soul, and the seeds are the things that are the experiences. They're the things that we saw, heard, experienced in our families of origin. And these seeds from these conversations that we've had or these situations that we've been in, they were scattered by our family of origin on the soil of our soul. Be clear, you didn't choose these seeds. You didn't have anything to do with determining which seeds would be scattered and which ones wouldn't be scattered. But all of us have had seeds scattered in the soil of our soul. And over time, we grow, we mature, and some of those seeds take root. We don't decide which ones take root. Some of them do, some of them don't. We're not sure why. But some of them take root, and eventually, over time, they grow into plants. And these plants are like our beliefs, our thought processes, they're the messages that we tell ourselves about who we are. They're the messages, the beliefs we tell ourselves about who God is, and the beliefs we tell ourselves about who the world is around us, who other people are. So these seeds grow into plants, and eventually, over time, each one of these plants produces fruit. Fruit are the actions or, or the attitudes that we have in our life today. Different kinds of seeds produce different kinds of fruit. And some of this fruit is good fruit. It's beautiful fruit. Some of this fruit, though, might not be good fruit, might not be beautiful fruit. But what's true of this fruit is that this fruit nourishes all the relationships that we have in our life, the relationships that we have in our family, even the relationship that we have with God. This fruit can make those relationships really healthy, and it can make the relationship sick. This fruit can push us closer and deeper into our relationship with God and with others, or it can push us further away from our relationship with God as others, and God and others. Remember, I talked about these seeds. 
I said that we didn't choose which seeds would be planted in us. And yet, there are still fruits that grow from those seeds. A friend reminds me often that while the seeds weren't our fault, the fruit is still our responsibility. The seeds that were scattered in the soil of your soul aren't your fault, but it's still your responsibility to deal with the fruit because the fruit is impacting you today. Let me kind of give you a story from my life about how this works in me. So uh, adoption is a big part of my story, and it's a long, complicated story. It's important for me uh, that, that you know that all the people who are involved in this story, they love me, But I remember in like that replay of my mind, the conversation when I learned that I was adopted. And there was a seed that was scattered in my soul. Over time, some of those seeds took root. And as they did, there was a, a plant of belief that grew in me, a message that I told myself about who I was. And that message is that there was something broken in me. That I was leavable. That I didn't belong fully and that I needed to figure out how to earn my way into this family. Mind you, nobody said those words. That wasn't what the seed was. The seed was just a conversation. But as that seed took root, that's what the plant that grew looked like. And over time, that plant produced fruit. And what that fruit was is that I tended to work hard in order to earn approval. I would work and work and work to try to earn my way into that family. Seeds grow to plants, produce fruit. That's not the only seed, though, that was planted in that situation. I also remember the first time that I heard the voice of God whisper to me, And I remember so distinctly him saying to me, Matt, I have chosen you. I have adopted you. I am your heavenly father. And that seed took root in the soil of my soul. And what grew from that seed was was this idea that, hang on a second. God doesn't choose leavable things. God chooses lovable things. And God chose me. And God gave me a family that chose me. I'm not leavable. I'm lovable. And chosen love is some of the best love out there. And so I can now choose the fruit that can grow from that plant. I can choose to love my family fiercely. And my wife knows that I love her. And my kids know that I love them. Seeds. Plants. Fruit. Same set of circumstances, same events, different seeds sown, different fruits grown, different fruits that are reaped from this. Now, all these people involved, I I know them all, I love them all. They all made wise decisions at that time. They did the best they could do with what they had to work with. And all of them had their own soil and their own soul. They had seeds from their past experiences. They had their own things that were growing, their own fruit. And I wrestled a lot, like, is it wrong for me to be thinking about these bad seeds that were sown by good people? Is that wrong? Should I not be thinking about that? And the more that I prayed about this, the more that I heard God's voice say, Matt, the seeds that have been scattered on the soil of your soul are both beautiful and broken. And the things that are growing in you are both beautiful and broken. And the fruits that are being produced in your soul are both beautiful and broken. And that's true of you too. We all have a garden of the soul. All of us have seeds that were scattered in it. You all have these beliefs about who you are, about who God is, about who the world is, and they're beautiful and broken. And so I guess the question that I have for all of us today is what's growing in the garden of your soul? What's being produced? What are the fruits that are coming out of the garden of your soul? Because I know this, I know that the things growing in the garden of our soul can change everything. 
And God knows it. In his scripture, God teaches us that that as we invite him into our life, he puts his Holy Spirit in us and his Holy Spirit takes root in our soul. And that Holy Spirit actually over time, it grows in us and it produces fruit in our soul. Paul in Galatians chapter five describes the fruit of the spirit this way. Paul says, but the fruit of the spirit is love. It's joy, peace, forbearance. It's a fancy way of saying patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that's the kind of fruit that I want in the garden of my soul. Those are the kinds of things that I want to be producing in my life because when those fruits are being produced, it draws me closer to others. It draws me closer to God. That's what I want. And we know that the fruit that our soul produces is determined by the things that are growing in us. Jesus says it this way in Luke chapter six. Jesus teaches us, no good tree bears bad fruit. If you have good things growing in the garden of your soul, you can expect good fruit to be produced from that. No good tree bears bad fruit, Jesus says, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. You can't expect for a, a bad uh, like plant that is growing in you to produce good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. Jesus says, look at the fruit in your life. Look at the fruit that the garden of your soul is, being, is, is producing. That fruit comes from what's growing in you. What's growing in the garden of our soul can change everything. So make sure that what's growing in the garden of your soul are the things of the Spirit of God, the things that produce the fruit of the Spirit of God. Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is a normal pattern to the garden of this world. There's a normal pattern pattern to this where, where it's not a tended garden, where you've got good things and bad things growing up together and good fruit and bad fruit growing up together. And the way that the normal world would deal with this is to try and just sort the fruit out if they can. Put the bad fruit over here and the good fruit over there and hopefully try to just minimize and suppress the bad fruit so that there's more good fruit coming out. But that's just behavior modification. That's not transformation. That's just fruit management. Paul says that there's transformation possible, that the garden of our soul can actually be transformed, that what grew in the past doesn't have to be what grows in the future. And the key to it all is Jesus' work on the cross, that he makes transformation, not just behavior modification, transformation possible. Jesus says we can find the beliefs growing in us that choke out the life, that produces the fruit, that pushes us away from others, we can cut it out and we can replace it with the Holy Spirit. For better or worse, we all have seeds that were sown in the garden of our soul from families that made us. And those seeds, they grow into plants that bear fruit in our life today. God says, tend to the garden Cultivate the good, cut out the bad, replace it with the truth of the spirit. All of us must look at what's growing in the garden. What's growing in us? Trace it down to the seed, find the source of it. Cultivate the garden so the fruit of the spirit is what comes out of us. So how do we do this? Well, the way we do this is we look at what's growing in us and for everything that's growing, we choose to do one of three things. We choose to cultivate it, We choose to contain it, or we choose to cut it out. So let's look at each of those three in turn. What that's growing in us needs to be cultivated, contained, or cut out. Things that that, that need to be cultivated are are the beliefs, the things that we tell ourselves about who we are, about who God is, about who the world is, the beliefs that are in line with the truth of the Scripture. Those are the things that need to be cultivated. The things that produce fruit that's in keeping with the fruit of the Spirit, that drive us closer to others, that drive us closer to God. Things like the, that produce fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, 
something in me that probably needs to be cultivated, and it's kind of funny, but my kids were, uh, my, my parents, rather, as I was a kid, were, let's just say affectionate. My parents were very affectionate with each other. It was not uncommon for uh, public displays of affection to happen in our house. I would uh, see my dad give my mom a long, lingering kiss before he left for work, which, by the way, for an 11-year-old is just about the grossest thing that you can imagine. That's not the seeds I want scattered on my soul, right? (laughs) But there was something that grew from that. And the thing that grew from that is this belief that it's actually healthy to express the way you feel about somebody. That, That it's good to show them the way that you feel. That's the belief that grew in me. And so now the fruit of that belief is that it's not uncommon for me to be holding my wife's hand in public. If you see us walking around, you'll probably see me holding her hand. It's not uncommon for me to kiss my wife in front of the kids, which has got two great benefits. Number one, it totally grosses them out. That's awesome. But number two, it's the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? It's love. My wife knows that I love her. My kids know that I love her. They see what that looks like. That's something in me that needs to be cultivated. It needs to be protected. I've got to make sure that the soil is taken care of around it. I have to celebrate it. I've got to lean into it. I need to have more and more of that cultivated in my life. You know, from my story, the things that I, I'm cultivating right now is the truth that I was chosen and that chosen love is some of the strongest love and that I can choose to love those around me. What in you needs to be cultivated? What beliefs about who you are, about who God is, about the world around you are in line with the truth of the scripture and are producing fruit in keeping with the fruit of the spirit that need to be cultivated? What in you needs to be cultivated? Some things growing in us need to be cultivated and some things growing in us need to be contained. These are the things that are growing in us that are good But if you don't put boundaries around them, they can get out of control. Um, Has anybody ever grown mint before in their garden? Raise your hand if you've grown mint. I don't know why you're laughing. I'm I'm unclear about why this is funny, but that's okay. So mint, mint is one of those things that if you plant mint, just prepare yourself. Because mint will take over your entire yard and two doors down while it's at it. Mint will grow in anywhere you want it. It will grow in your bedroom. It'll grow anywhere. Mint is great. I really like mint. I think it's delicious. But it's in desserts and drinks and cooking and all that kind of stuff. But mint needs to be contained. You can't just leave it here. Mint needs to be put in a pot. It needs some boundaries. It needs some barriers put on it. There are some things in our life that are good, but if we don't contain them, they can get out of control. For example, maybe for you, money was really tight as a kid. And you watched your parents struggle through trying to make ends meet. That was a seed that was scattered in your soul. And what took root is this belief, this fear that that money could disappear at any moment. So you better be careful with money. And now the fruit that that is being born by this thing that is growing, the, the fruit, the good fruit, is that you're really careful with money. That you save that you don't spend easily, and that's great, right? But if you let this thing get out of control, all of a sudden this this can creep into other areas and it, it looks like stinginess. And then maybe you're not generous. And then maybe all of a sudden money becomes an idol and the point is money. You see, that's a good thing that needs to be contained. In my life, uh, I've got this whole thing that tells me I need to perform, right? Right? that I need to earn it. It's actually really good for me to be able to set goals and accomplish them. That's not a bad thing. I don't need to like cut that out of me. I need to continue that. But the second that performance moves into an approval place where I'm trying to like work in order so that others will approve of me, uh, that's something that needs to be contained. Some things in our life, some beliefs that we have about ourselves, about God, about others, they need to be cultivated. Some things need to be contained. And finally, some things in us need to be cut out. Cut out and replaced. These are the things that we tell ourselves about who we are, about who God is, about who the world is that are not in keeping with the truth of the scripture, that do not produce the fruit of the spirit. 
These are the things in us that actually will grow and spread and choke out the good in our soul. And it's one of those things where sometimes it's hard to know, is this good or is this bad? I mean, I look at this thing and I say, is this a plant or is this a weed? I mean, it's got pretty little purple flowers on it. You might look at something that's grown and say, look, it's even got cool little red berries. Maybe those taste good. But it's poison, right? It needs to be named for what it is because the fruit of these things is gonna make you sick. It's gonna make your relationship sick. It's gonna push you further and further away from it. The only thing you can do with the weed is you push it down, you cut it out. You've gotta find it all the way to the roots. You gotta get your hands dirty. You pull it out and you toss it aside and you replace it with the truth of the spirit. Maybe in you, what you saw was was your parents fighting. I don't know what that looked like. Maybe it was big and loud and scary. Or maybe it was silent treatment and isolation and scary. And over time, you saw your parents lose each other, lose that companionship. And that relationship ended in divorce. And that seed was scattered on your soul. And now the thing that grows from it is this idea that conflict will leave you alone. Conflict will leave you isolated. Getting deep with people is going to hurt you. And so the fruit that this produces in your life today is that you avoid conflict and that you don't go deep with people. Guys, that is not in keeping with the truth of the Spirit. It's not how God teaches us. It's not the truth. What, that needs, to, what needs to happen with that is we have to dig deep. We've got to do the hard soil work in our soul. We've got to get our hands dirty, trace it all the way back to the root and pull it out. We have to replace it with the truth of who God says that we are. Has to be done. I can tell you in my life, what I'm cutting out is this idea that what I do is the same thing as who I am. That how I perform is the same thing as how I'm valuable. That is a weed. And it might have some flowers of the fact that I actually perform well at stuff, but it's still a weed. It's choking out the good in my life, isn't it? I have to cut it out. I've got to get it all the way to the source. I've got to move it away and replace it with the truth of the Spirit. And the truth of the Spirit is that God says, I am who he says I am, right? And he says that I am loved. We all have a garden in our soul. And what is growing in the garden of our soul will determine the fruit that we experience in our life. And so once again, the question I have for you is what is growing in the garden of your soul? Does it need to be cultivated? Does it need to be contained? Does it need to be cut out? We're going to close here. And I just want to give you a a little bit of time to think about this. Maybe maybe this is one of those talks for you that you could walk away with and say, that was really interesting. Cool garden on stage. Not sure it applies to me. I actually would invite everybody now to take out maybe your phone or take out a pen and a piece of paper if you're taking notes. But go ahead and take your phone out and make three different lists. Cultivate, contain, and cut out. And I just want you to think just for a little bit, what beliefs, what things growing in you, what attitudes, what beliefs about who God is, who you are, what the world looks like, what are those things in you that need to be cultivated, that are in line with the truth of scripture, that produce fruit in keeping with the fruit of the spirit, that you need to protect, celebrate, what in you needs to be cultivated? List a couple of them. What in you needs to be contained? It's good. But if you don't put boundaries around it, it's going to take over and it's going to choke out the good things in your life. List two or three. What in you needs to be contained? And thirdly, what are the beliefs that you have, the messages you tell yourself about who you are and who God is? that need to be cut out and replaced with the truth of the Spirit. 
the weeds whose roots go far too deep, the things that are making your life sick. I list a couple of those too. Friends, God's desire for all of us is that our soul would produce good fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. But we can't manufacture that fruit of the Spirit in us. It's not something where you just try really, really hard to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. We can't behavior modify our way into the fruit of the Spirit. It's only possible when we say, God, the garden of my soul is overrun. I've got all the plants mixed up. The good is growing with the not good. The fruits are all mixed up in me and the roots are going so deep and I I can't really trace out what goes to what. I don't know what to do. Only you know how to transform this garden, God. So I need you. I need your truth. Would you invade me? Would you take over? I surrender. Would you cut out what is false and replace it with what is true? There are some things that are so deep that only God can cut them out. And it might be painful, but God is with us all the way doing his work in the garden of our soul. So this week, may we be humble. May we surrender all of it, the seeds, the plants, the things growing in us, the fruit, May we surrender all of it to the great keeper of the garden. May we ask him to show us what needs to be cultivated, contained, and cut out. May we invite his spirit in our life, and may we experience the fruit that grows. Amen? Amen. Would you please stand as we close? Yeah, so this is one of those talks that can open some things. And so there's a couple of next steps that I just want to offer to you. Uh, one, if, if God is stirring in you, I encourage you to pray with somebody today. We've got, we've got a prayer room. I'll be down front. I'd love to pray with you as well. But if God is stirring in you, ask for somebody to come alongside. Two, we're actually launching a podcast that goes along with this entire series. And if you want to go deeper, specifically on family of origin issues, this podcast is perfect for you. It's called the Relate Podcast. You can find it on the Willow app. You can go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And it's going to be for every week of this family series. And three, maybe this is something that you don't need to to go through alone. Maybe you need a counselor. Maybe you need a friend. I just want to challenge you to invite somebody into this journey. To cut out and replace can be painful. It can be hard. And you need a friend to go through it with you. With that, would you pray with me and we'll close. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for choosing us, for adopting us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that invades our souls. Thank you for the hope of transformation that where the garden was yesterday doesn't have to be where the garden is tomorrow. Thank you that you are with us and that it's your hands that can ultimately cultivate, contain, and cut out the things that need to be cut out. God, we surrender ourselves to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.